Hello, this is an addendum to part one in the series of videos on notation and terminology in vibrational astrology. And I'm making this addendum for a few reasons. Number one, at the end of the first video in the series of videos, I believe there's eight videos in the series. At the end of the first one, there's a definition of focal planet on the slide, but I forget to go over it. So number one, I want to just go over that. I think it's obvious, but I just want to make sure we've covered it. And the few questions have come up from Astrology DC subscribers about things that I explain. And I want to clarify these those questions and also add an additional point that I don't actually cover very clearly. So number one, the focal planet. The focal planet, I think you've got this very simple, but in a midpoint structure, for example, the one shown on the right side, Saturn is the focal planet. Saturn is opposition, the midpoint of Mercury and Jupiter with a 29-minute orb. This is the midpoint structure from the birth chart of Julia Roberts that we covered in the first video in the series. But anyway, it's a midpoint structure. That planet is called the focal planet. Very simple. And when we say midpoint in this context, we mean near midpoint. So you're taking the shortest distance between Mercury and Jupiter and that midpoint, that point halfway, measuring the shortest distance between Mercury and Jupiter, we're, that's the midpoint, more specifically often called the near midpoint. So Saturn opposition, the Mercury-Jupiter midpoint, also means that Saturn is conjunct the far midpoint. Okay, now this is an interesting point. Let's look at this chart wheel in the lower right corner with the moon at 24 Leo and the sun at 4 Scorpio. And the midpoint happens to be 29 degrees, 25 minutes of Virgo, shown down here in the third house. Now, in vibrational astrology, we use a one and a half degree orb for a planet near 29 Virgo 25. So if a planet is within one and a half degrees of 29 degrees, 25 minutes of Virgo, we say that that's a midpoint structure and that planet is conjunct the midpoint of Sun and Moon. Similarly, if a planet is within one and a half degrees of 29 Pisces 25, again, we have a midpoint structure and that planet is opposition the midpoint because it's opposition the near midpoint at, in Virgo. Now, what's interesting here is that we're using the same orb regardless of whether it's conjunction or opposition. And in a way, this seems like maybe it's contradicting how we do orbs in vibrational astrology. Because in vibrational astrology, if we use a one and a half degree orb for conjunction, then we would use half that orb for an opposition. So if the near midpoint, this midpoint at 29 degrees, 25 minutes, a Virgo, if that is like the midpoint, then a planet opposition, the orb for oppositions is half of conjunctions. However, what's really happening is that both midpoints, 29 Virgo 25 and 29 Pisces 25, are equal in power. So really what we're assuming in vibrational astrology is the power of the midpoint axis. So it's only language, like when we say a planet is conjunct the sun-moon midpoint. So for example, if Jupiter was at 29 and a half degrees Virgo, we would say Jupiter is conjunct the sun moon midpoint. If Jupiter, on the other hand, is at 29 and a half Pisces, we would say Jupiter's opposition the sun moon midpoint. Well, its opposition, the near midpoint, means it's conjunct the far midpoint, and the evidence appears to be that we really need to think of both midpoints as equally important, both the 29 Virgo 25 and the 29 Pisces 25. They're both equally important. So it's not that the near midpoint is more powerful than the far midpoint. 
we believe that they act differently. I say we believe because until we get controlled research studies that confirm something, and it's only from our personal experience, we're not completely confident. But from interpreting charts, it appears that both midpoints, the near midpoint and the far midpoint, are equally important. They act a little differently. So things can act differently but have the same strength and power and importance and relevance in our lives, and that's what's going on here. So it is not contradicting the rules of vibrational astrology that a planet opposition the midpoint gets the same orb as a planet conjunct the midpoint because that opposition point is on an axis. The midpoint axis is a, is a line of symmetry, and that line of symmetry is what is powerful here. So, you know, whether we say that a planet is conjunct the, the near midpoint, and we think of that midpoint as primary, and if we thought of the far midpoint as secondary, it does make a difference. This is not just semantics. Because if the near midpoint, I've, I've already said this, but let me just restate it differently. If the near midpoint was like the real midpoint, the 29 Virgo 25 is like the real midpoint. If that was the case, then based on the, the laws, you might say, of vibrational astrology, the rules that we use, the opposition would get half the orb. It does not get half the orb. In the interpretation of natal charts, it appears that the orb is the same. And going back to Reinhold Everton, Alfred Vitta, going back, you know, to way back into the middle of the 20th century, they also believed that the conjunction and opposition have the same orb, and that does appear to be the case. So it's really a midpoint axis, it's really a line of symmetry, and it's the distance from the line of symmetry that's important. Okay, so I just want to make that clear, and to make it clear that how you express these things is, is not always reflecting how things work. So again, if we say Jupiter's conjunct, the sun, moon, midpoint, uh, th that doesn't mean it's like a conjunction in the same way as a conjunction between planets, because in with midpoints, the opposition is equal in importance and, ha and operates the same way and has the same orb. It's an orb to the axis. This is an axis, and both ends of the axis are equally important. Okay, well, I've said it over and over again. <laughs> I just wanted to, to clarify that. Um, and this just repeats what I've already said. We do not have ed evidence from controlled research studies confirming clearly what the orb is. You know, we do the controlled research studies, such as, for example, the extreme case sampling studies, and, and we see what the people who have the most of something in their charts, who have a certain um, ta talent or skill, and, and we see if we can build a model that's consistent with what the people are doing with their lives and what's in the charts. We haven't d tested the orbs that carefully to see if, for example, um, if, if Jupiter is conjunct the sun-moon midpoint, that would make the person Jupiterian in, in a positive way because the sun-moon midpoint is an integrating point. So the person is able to relate to people in, who have different uh, stories in their lives who have different history, different uh, background because moon is the past, it's your moods, it's your it's your heritage. Uh, so the way you express your heritage in your life, sun, moon, midpoint, Jupiter means it's open, it's growing, it's easily accessible. So Jupiter conjunct sun, moon, midpoint indicates a person who relates well to many different kinds of people uh, is easily approachable and connects well with a large range of different kinds of people and is able to make relationships between different kinds of environments, different kinds of communities, and so on. The opposition, from our experience, will do the same thing, the Jupiter opposition, and if the orb is more than a degree and a half, it's weak.
Doesn't matter whether it's a conjunction or an opposition. Once you get to that degree and a half orb, that's, the effect of it seems to be disappearing. Now, we could test that in a study by seeing people who have Jupiter conjunct or opposition, the sun-moon midpoint or any other midpoint configuration, and see if in both cases of conjunction and opposition it appears to be weak. If we start seeing that the people with the conjunction have more of those qualities in opposition, that would suggest the orb is bigger for conjunction. So we, you know, we haven't done those kind of controlled research studies yet, but it seems fairly clear from personal observation that the conjunctions and oppositions have the same orb in midpoint structures. Okay. All right, so because the orbs appear to be the same, it appears that we're really dealing with a midpoint axis, uh, which is acting as a line of symmetry. And that line of symmetry uh, is creating resonance because anything equally distant from the line of symmetry has the same angular distance, and the same angular distance causes resonance. Now, um, I want to mention a few things here. Number one, that we have a, a name, queer name, that we often use, the focal planet or focal point, because maybe you have the, mid, the midheaven or ascendant or vertex or any number of other things at the midpoint of sun and moon. So really, more properly, we could say 29 Virgo 25 um, is the midpoint of sun and moon, and any point, a focal point there, um, creates the midpoint structure. What we do not have is we do not have clear and consistent terms for the sun and moon. This is a question that's come up from some of the Astrology DC subscribers who've already watched the videos. It's like, what do you call those? Well, there are different terms. I've heard people call them the base planets, like they're the base as opposed to the focal planet. Some people call them the surrounding planets because they're the planets that surround equally distant from the midpoint. Some people call these the legs of the midpoint structure. There's three different terms. I kind of like surrounding planets, but we don't have uh, a term that we've picked out. Maybe we should have one. Maybe we should all agree in vibrational astrology that we'll call these the surrounding planets of the midpoint structure. You know, we, we you know, as a community of vibrational astrologers, we should see how we feel about it. So if you, you know, have a feeling about it, you could share what you think we should call the sun and moon in this particular situation. They're, they're the surrounding planets and the planet at 29 Virgo 25 or 29 Pisces 25, you know, with an orb of that is the focal planet. Okay, so that's another little detail about... Um, these midpoint structures that I want to make clear. And let me say this about interpretation, because this is another thing that has come up about midpoint structures. Okay, we've established that, to the best of our knowledge, our current rules in vibrational astrology is that a planet, conjunct or opposition, the midpoint, that focal planet, gets an orb of one and a half degrees. It has to be within one and a half degrees of the midpoint. And they're equally important. But is the meaning different? If Jupiter is at 29 Pisces 25, is that different from being at 29 Virgo 25? And there has not been a lot of discussion about this. I haven't um, spoken about this very much in the courses that I've taught. But I do think there's a difference. Um, and, and I, I've written it down here on the left side, that if a planet is at the near midpoint, at the 29 Virgo 25 in this case, or in other words, as we would say, conjunct the midpoint, it appears that that midpoint structure is expressed as a kind of inner personal quality. And if the planet is at the far midpoint, at 29 Pisces 25, it's a more um, dynamic and expressive combination. So in this case, sun and moon are close together, you know, from 24 Leo 
to four Scorpio. You know, it, they're on the same side. One is in same side of the chart. One's in the second house. One's in the fourth house. So a planet here is acting in a interpersonal way. This is how the person is. This is what's important to them. If Jupiter was opposition, it, it's acting like an opposition. It's acting more as an expression in the outer world, as something that the person wants a response to. That you want to engage in a larger, more dynamic social context or a larger, more dynamic context in which there's give and take and confrontation and different, you know, and, and different points of view. When it's a conjunction, it's just, this is me, this is what I do. I don't need to tell people about it. I don't need to get a response. I need to do this and I need to feel right about it. So if Jupiter's conjunct that sun moon midpoint, it means I'm open, I'm receptive, I'm interested, I'm not quite as gregarious, I'm not quite as concerned about people that are not as open and uh, accepting and tolerant as I am. You know, if it's an opposition, it's more of a social dynamic con interest and engagement. So with Jupiter opposition to Sun Moon, there's a, an emphasis on wanting to share, wanting to bring out, wa and wanting to see how the world will respond to an open, unbiased, welcoming approach to different lifestyles, different heritages, different communities, and to connect and develop them. Okay, so um, that seems to be the difference. And if the sun and moon are close to being opposition, like if the moon is in Cancer and the sun is in Capricorn, or something like that, or Gemini and Sagittarius, you know, their opposition, there seems to be less of this dynamic of, it's, the conjunction is not as conspicuous and the opposition is not as conspicuous. It's when the planets are relatively close together that that planet is clearly conjunct the midpoint. So planet 29, Virgo 25 in this case is, is all these planets are on the same side of the chart wheel. And they're, and they're more self-expressive. So if they're all, that's really what it is. If they're all on one side and fairly bunched up, it's a self-expression. If it's spread out way across the chart, it has more of an oppositional feeling, a sharing, a relating, a seeing what the response is. And if it's closer to being like a T-square where the sun and moon are almost opposite each other, it has... Again, there's a kind of more polarity because you get the sun and moon opposition and there's a more dynamic feeling, a more a feeling of this needing to be resolved, that anything that's unresolved needs to be resolved as the two surrounding planets, let's use that term, surrounding planets, as they approach opposition. Now, these are... Uh, not clearly defined. We do we do not put a lot of emphasis on it. It's somewhat speculative. So this is not part of the strong core of vibrational astrology theory. What we do is we get the ideas out there like I'm doing right now. Different vibrational astrologers work with it, get, see examples, and we're especially interested in examples that contradict what I'm saying. So if somebody has Jupiter conjunct Sun Moon and they are presenting it to the world and wanting feedback and it's really largely engaged and somebody else has it you know in an opposition and it does not feel like that then we you know we have to question the idea and maybe throw it out um, so we just need to see how consistent it is um, at least in in a wide range of personal experience and then eventually you know, go through the database and confirm it. That's our sense of it at this point. Ideas in vibrational astrology vary from the rock solid, we're sure of this, to 
this is the way it appears to be. And the difference between a planet conjunct a midpoint and opposition, you know, yeah, I wouldn't say it's totally vague. It, it, it seems pretty clear that that's what's going on, but it's not rock solid. And also it seems like it gets overpowered by other things. You don't want to put a huge emphasis on it. Not at this point, because it seems to be a fairly subtle distinction. So it's something to be aware of. It's something to look at, as a lot of people look at it, and we get examples and share. Maybe we'll modify our theories, and especially if we do a controlled research study, uh, then we definitely would modify our theories if we find the data is telling us something different. But probably something along the lines of what I'm saying is going to be confirmed. Seems fairly evident, but we'll see. Now, another thing about midpoint structures to clarify in this addendum to information I put out in that first video in the series is this, with a midpoint structure, or maybe I don't even get to midpoint structures till later. Well, anyway, the, <laughs> sorry about that. This is an addendum somewhere along the line to the, to the, to the uh, series of videos that, that I made because I don't cover this, this actually, actually will be a later video, is that in these midpoint structures, here's a chart where Jupiter, Pluto, and Mercury are all extremely close. In this case, they're within 12 minutes. So my question is this, is Jupiter conjunct the Mercury-Pluto midpoint? Clearly, Pluto is conjunct the Mercury-Jupiter midpoint. But is Jupiter conjunct the Mercury-Pluto midpoint? Well, if you use the rule, is Jupiter within a degree and a half of the Mercury-Pluto midpoint? Yes, it is. In fact, it's over here on the right side. It's only 12 minutes. On the other hand, some people have thought this looks peculiar. Jupiter's at the midpoint, but it's not in between them? How can Jupiter be at the midpoint, but it's not even... in? in between the two planets. It might seem like an odd idea. Well, the evidence is that Jupiter is at the midpoint of Mercury and Pluto. And similarly, Mercury is at, at the, Mercury's the midpoint of Jupiter and Pluto. All three midpoint structures are there. And when you look at the midpoint trees produced by the Kepler or Sirius program, and I think other programs do it the same way, all three show up and all three are valid. So the way that midpoints work is the way that they work. It doesn't have to conform to our language or whatever any one particular astrologer's intuition is. What seems to be happening is that there is this line of symmetry, this line of resonance where anything close to that line is, is going to activate it. And Jupiter is very close to the Mercury-Pluto uh, midpoint axis, and Mercury is very close to the Jupiter-Pluto midpoint axis. All three of those axes are almost identical, and all three midpoint structures work. I just wanted to mention that, because it's another question that sometimes come out, comes up, is, is Jupiter really at the Mercury-Pluto midpoint, even though it's not in between them? Answer is, yes, it is. It, that seems to, to, to work. Okay. All right, so that's uh, what I wanted to cover just to clarify a few points that maybe were not clear. And I did add a, you know, a clarification about the importance of the midpoint axis and thinking about the midpoint axis, two opposite ends of a pole that act differently the, you know, the opposition pole acts more oppositional. And, and, and also, this polarity of the midpoint axis, the qualities of it are going to depend on how far apart the surrounding planets are from each other. So all of this is going to affect the quality of the midpoint structure, but not the strength. Not the strength. Fortunately, strength is very simple. You get a one and a half degree orb for a planet on the midpoint axis. That's all there is to it. Very, very simple. It's very elegant and also, I think, a reasonable idea. And, and it works out in our, in our work with clients.
Okay. So that's it, my friend. I, I hope that clarifies a few points and brings out a few things. And, and probably most of you haven't thought of these details yet. But when you encounter them, hopefully this information will help. Okay. Thank you very much for listening. God bless. Namaste.